Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our series of marine-based IPCA or Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas webinars. Uh, we're excited to be here with you guys tonight for our second last one this fiscal. Tonight, we're going to hear from Amy Gromack from DFO on her team's work on ecologically significant areas as a tool for fish and fish habitat protection. Uh, so hopefully you're here for the right webinar. Before we get started with Amy, we'll go throughout some housekeeping and I'll introduce myself for those of you who are new to our series. Uh, my name is Beck Borchert, Marine Protected Areas Coordinator for the Gwilamumaglu Suahan, or KMKNO. A little bit about our organization while everyone logs in and gets settled. We were created to oversee the negotiations and consultation process between the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, the province, and the Government of Canada. So KMK is governed and receives our mandates from the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, and collectively we work together on broader nation issues for the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. Uh, the webinars, the series, and tonight's webinar is not just from KMKNO, but a collaborative effort with other Mi'kmaq organizations. Our partners include the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources, or UINR. They represent the five Mi'kmaq communities on Cape Breton Island here in Nova Scotia. UINR was formed to ensure the sustainable use and protection of natural resources while maintaining Unamagi Mi'kmaq traditions and worldviews. We also work with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, or CMM. They're a nonprofit that works to proactively promote and assist Mi'kmaq community members and initiatives towards self-determination and enhancement of community. Also with us as a partner is Oceans North, who supports marine conservation in partnership with Indigenous and coastal communities. So as everyone gets settled into our webinar tonight, we just want to welcome you here. We have a few housekeeping tidbits for those of you who are new to our series, uh, especially important tonight. We do have 25-ish people pre-registered, so we're excited to be hosting all of you. As always, as you join, if you could keep your microphones off and cameras off during the presentation, that way we can all focus on the screen. Uh, remember that there is a door prize tonight, so we'll be selecting somebody uh, using a random name picker, and we'll send you an email afterwards. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, just go ahead and type them in our chat. Our wonderful facilitator, Heidi, will be sure to check on the chat and address all your questions later. later. Uh, the presentation portion is open to anybody, but just a gentle reminder that the last 30 minutes of tonight's webinar is really just meant for Mi'kmaq or Indigenous participants. So we'll just ask that if you don't identify as such, that you log off at 7 o'clock and leave the last 30 minutes as an Indigenous space for question and answers. Uh, if you do log off or if you weren't able to make it tonight, all of the webinar will be recorded. It's released on our YouTube page and we'll be sure to drop the link in the chat for you. We are going to be uh, hosting opening and closing prayers tonight. Hi, um, my name is Allison Bernard. I'm from Eskazoni. Um, I, I work with uh, the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. Um, going into, I think, 11 years or going on 12 years. Um, I am Mi'kmaq, uh, a long line of, uh, I guess, leadership. And um, I can't really say that uh, environmentalists or whomever, uh, it's just, it just comes natural when you're a Mi'kmaq living on the land and everything that's been passed down to you, uh, you know what's going on. Um, I am 57 years old, so I've seen my fair share of uh, changes in this world from technology to uh, playing outside when you're a kid and nothing to do and get chased back into the house uh, when you're a kid because you still didn't want to go in. But, you know, that was my life. Uh, I've seen things change. And over the years now, I think we've gone too far ahead of ourselves in, in everything that we do. Um, we've lost, uh, I think, uh, the need to take care of our environment, our waters and our air, uh, everything around us. Uh, we've enjoyed for thousands of years of really coming to trouble. Um, so that's why we're here tonight uh, and all the days that we get together. Um, we try to fix things before they actually get worse. Um, I think being, being Mi'kmaq, we totally understand, uh, what's been taking place, um, especially for guys that have been around for a while. Um, I'm very old in my culture. Uh, I know what's going on. My language is my, my base. Uh, I, I've kept, I've kept it. Um, I'm not that sharp with English. Um, never really learned anything until, um, 
I was like five years old, maybe primary or whatever. When I was introduced to uh, education and the colonial education, I guess uh, I would call it. Um, it was never really based on facts. Uh, uh, when it came to the Mi'kmaq and even in Canada, in North America, but over the years, we've come to a better, much better understanding of you know, the need that we all need to work together uh, as a unified nation, I guess, uh, in all nations, wherever we all originate from. But, you know, being Mi'kmaq, I welcome everybody here tonight. Um, and uh, I hope we all get together. Um, and during my opening prayer, uh, I will say it in Mi'kmaq. Um, it's always in Mi'kmaq because uh, this is what the creator has asked me to you know, use. Uh, that's my language. Um, I don't have to think about stuff that I want to say because it's all natural. It just flows out uh, when it's Mi'kmaq. I don't know if people understand that. Um, it is my first language. And like I said, it seems like that the creator gives you something to, to say and to unify everybody that's uh, listening and watching in these uh, podcasts and uh, things that we do here. Um, it's very important that we maintain who we are, the integrity of your nation. And uh, you know that's what we strive here with uh, the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. We'll move my office. Uh, it's a nice place. It's, a, it's an awesome community to be working with because you, your extended community is all the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. And uh, whoever else that we may come into contact with, um, you know, it's a great feeling. Uh, we are a very welcoming people. So I, I welcome everybody in Mi'kmaq. And I hope uh, tonight uh, we do well. Thank you. Okay, Medal Altio, um, Louisie Nelson, let's go with that. And Amiga Magi, I'm no, the Amiga Ma, what you did you, what the back so did you? The Lord Louis, I also demand, and they'll be speed at me, uh, and the Lord T. Mulona, the whole group school of war. I'm a born and model dig, I'm such a abata, wisest car, Jewish. Someone eat to go, mommy go eat to go, Mazif skid about Daji. But what will all your tandil be dial? You'd do a buzzer, ask the marches, and then my deck. And there was it was a discom, Ochid Niscom, or what you would discom. His oak, a dowry viscona, that was covered diaga, his cook. Do school to McDonald, do departus nina, mommy go, someone in the あ、ちょっとしかわいそうしかいだじゃな、おじぐりじゅくたんげのおじぐりま。いや、おしいがミスか。いそう。きさ。アンコールムのマミゴ。アンコールムのサンワン。マシスケミナ。ムスコイダウ
So um, just to start with Amy's bio. So Amy was raised in Nova Scotia, where she currently resides and works at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Amy has been working in marine conservation since 2008 after receiving her Master of Marine Management degree from Dalhousie University. At that time, she worked with DFO exploring opportunities for potential coastal marine protected area designation, designations in Nova Scotia under the Canada's Ocean Act. Amy later went on to work in consulting as a lead on marine environmental assessments for major projects in British Columbia. And in 2015, Amy returned home to Nova Scotia to work with DFO's Species at Risk program as a recovery biologist for white shark and other species. Since 2019, Amy has been working as a national co-lead on the development of a national policy framework for the implementation of ecologically significant areas under the Canada's Fisheries Act and is working on the identification of potential ESAs locally. So Amy, I'm delighted to have you uh, take us through your presentation tonight. And I think that um, the ESAs have been of particular interest to everybody, uh, especially since we're just starting some new ground in that area. So I appreciate you uh, taking the opportunity to share with us. We'll do that little test to make sure everything's working. If you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Sounds good, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Perfect. Here, one second here. Okay, it looks like I'm sharing it. It's great, we'll just step you. It's perfect and I'll just turn my mic off and you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for coming and listening to this talk. I see a few familiar names and looking forward to hearing from and meeting others on this call. So, and thanks for that great introduction, Heidi. So I'm gonna walk through a bit of an overview on ecologically significant areas, what they are um, and the role in Canada. And then I'm going to explain them through a case study that we've done in this region. Um, on the St. Mary's River or Nabusaganuk in Mi'kmaq to better explore the, the um, concept of ESAs because there actually aren't any in Canada. So I find presenting this um, helps illustrate what ESAs could look like. And then I'll give a few a bit of an overview of our national framework for identifying, establishing, and managing ESAs. So ESAs are a spatial tool that can be made under Canada's Fisheries Act. So it comes with, uh, with boundaries and regulations, and it's intended to provide long-term protection and conservation of fish habitat that's sensitive, highly productive, rare, or unique. So those are the cr ecological criteria for um, designating and identifying an ESA. And an area only needs to meet one of those criteria, but ideally meets um, many of those criteria. Um, there are none designated in Canada, as I mentioned. So this is a really great opportunity to bring in a two-eyed seeing approach and explore future steps and collaboration on ESA implementation with Indigenous groups and really start from start that from the beginning, um, since we have none in Canada. So they can be designated in marine areas, in estuaries, and in freshwater, and they can also capture riparian zones. So the strip of land that is next to um, next to fresh water. And sometimes people refer to the land next to marine waters as marine riparian. It's, it's not as commonly called that, but we do have the ability to um, protect those areas that could impact fish habitat um, if they're land on land. So every ESA would have its own conservation and protection objectives. And based on those, they would determine the regulations and what types of things would potentially impact what you're trying to protect. So there's no sort of standard for what all ESAs will protect from. It depends on what, what are you trying to protect and what the threats are. So we do know that regulations, according to the Fisheries Act, can prohibit activities, or if they're not prohibited, they could have a set of regulations in the ESA regulation, a set of requirements, I should say, so that it's not just status quo for those activities. So if something's not prohibited, we can set if we can set very um, high thresholds with a low tolerance for risk to make sure that those activities are conducted in a way that doesn't compromise the intent of the area. And a unique thing about this tool is that they're not intended to regulate fishing. It's meant to regulate the other types of things that DFO um, reviews to make sure that fish and fish habitat are not, are not um, 
um, impacted as per the Fisheries Act. So we do regulate other things like oil and gas activities, mining impacts to fish and fish habitat, um, even like a forestry road crossing over a water body is something that DFO reviews. Water withdrawals from um, fresh water. We do regulate a number of different activities other than fishing. So those are um, those are the, the focus of ESAs as it was seen as a, as a need to provide better protection um, from those types of activities when the Fisheries Act was recently changed. And this is really a proactive tool. So when we get um, project proposals in DFO, it, it's, it's reactive. So we have a, a whole unit called the Regulatory Reviews Unit, and they review projects as they come. Something's proposed and they have to make sure it complies with the Fisheries Act. And so this is a way to identify upfront, what are the requirements? Is something allowed at all? Is, is, are these activities allowed? It will say in the regulation how things, if it's allowed and how it, um, what sort of standards have to be met for the activity to occur. So it's very proactive. And then the last thing on the slide is just around the national framework. So we, we do have a draft available online. Um, it's really near the finalization stages, so you will see it coming out um, uh, in April, likely, as a published um, framework. And I'll talk more about that at the end. So there is a role for ESAs to play in Canada. They're intended to provide a stronger level of protection compared to the rest of the Fisheries Act. So you can... Um, you can basically, you know, destroy fish and fish habitat and cause the death of fish um, other than with activities other than fishing and, and get approval by DFO. It's quite a lengthy process. You can get an authorization to do those things provided you can offset for those impacts. But an ESA is really meant to provide a much stronger level of protection. So you wouldn't be allowed to destroy fish habitat in an ESA like you could outside of an ESA. Um, if it if it links to what you're trying to protect. So it's a much stronger, um, it's a strong tool that we have that's brand new. And it fills a gap in Canada by offering protection to areas that are, are unprotected otherwise. So watersheds and estuaries, um, pieces of those um, <clears throat> areas can be protected by other types of like provincial um, protected areas, for example, but they're not really, the intent isn't really fish and fish habitat. So it's usually just like portions of watersheds, not, not thinking of freshwater and the needs for fish in a more holistic um, ecosystem approach. And particularly in the marine environment, they can fill the gap of the intertidal zone and offering protection there and that, and protection from land-based impacts that could be affecting fish habitat. So like sedimentation on eelgrass beds, for example, so that's not something that can be done under Canada's Oceans Act, um, where marine protected areas start at the low water mark and go seaward. So this is a, a sort of a marine niche for ESAs. It's a great um, tool to contribute to climate change resiliency by protecting carbon sinks um, and you know protecting those nature-based solutions like salt marshes. Then there's eelgrass beds and and wetlands. So those are all carbon sinks, also riparian trees and riparian zones. Um, and it's and it's a good way to protect sort of cold water refugia that are found in freshwater systems that are really, really important for species that use both marine and freshwater environments like salmon that are really um, sensitive to temperature change and warming temperatures. So it's a great tool to protect areas that are cold water refugia and to keep them that way. Um, they're a great way to complement other protected areas like uh, Indigenous protected and conserved areas and other effective area-based conservation measures by contributing to those objectives. Potentially, um, they're adjacent or maybe they're overlaid with each other. We don't really know because there are no ESAs, but it's definitely something that would be really interesting to explore. And um, DFO does support Indigenous-led marine conservation we're including working with our partners to look at visions for IPCAs, and, and this may be one way to, to look at a potential co-designation by overlapping, for example. So we're really keen to understand IPCAs better and, and opportunities for, for working together and how ESAs kind of fit within that picture. 
Another point is that ESAs could be counted towards Canada's marine, inland water, and terrestrial conservation targets of 30% by 2030. I don't think we're quite ready to meet the 25 by 25 target, but we could um, it, potentially ESAs could be counted towards those later targets. And it's a tool to help conserve aquatic species at risk um, and many other species, but um, species that don't get protection through Species at Risk Act or provincial. Um, endangered Species Acts can get protection through an ESA. And this is slide, I won't go through all of this in detail, but I think for, for this, I'll just kind of focus on the, the key differences with ESAs and Oceans Act marine protected areas, um, since there's a lot here. And I'll kind of talk about the, those differences on other slides as well, using, using the Nabusaganup case study example and, and eelgrass. Um, but generally, ESAs and Oceans Act MPAs are both made using governor and council regulations. So it's the same type of regulation. It's the same kind of process and path to, to get to the end um, designation. Um, there's a lot of uh, potential differences in that path, but there's certain regulatory requirements that are exactly the same for both, both types of uh, protections. And as I mentioned, ESAs can offer protection in geographic areas where MPAs can't. And in marine areas, it's a tool to be considered instead of an MPA, depending on the main threats um, and what the conservation priorities are. So if fishing is not the main threat of concern, then an ESA is a great way, is a, is a great option to address other threats because the ESAs don't, are not intended to address phishing directly. So th that's why, you know, if phishing's not, then an ESA is certainly a good option. So we can also, with an ESA, um, as I sort of mentioned before, with MPAs, it's things are either prohibited or they're exempt. And in an ESA, they're prohibited or there's, there's further requirements. So we can also, rather than prohibit things, um, have in the regulations very specific requirements for how these activities can be conducted so that they can occur, but in a more sustainable way to make sure we achieve the conservation objectives. So I'll let's kind of skip through the rest of this in the interest of time, and then I can go back to it if people are interested in, in hearing about the differences between critical habitat and, and our normal um, review process for activities. So now on to the case study, Nabusaganuk. So just to set the, the stage here for a case study and what that means, and, and really it's meant to explore what an ESA could look like. And others across Canada had sort of started to think about this. Um, and the reason is really to better understand the tool and, and help inform the framework where we're developing. So, we kind of embarked on this largely as a way to understand what this could mean. Um, and we also think that this area, it picked it because it's so important for, for many species, particularly Atlantic salmon. And I'll go through sort of the ecological importance of the, of the site as well. So this is the, the area, um, Nabusaganuk, so the St. Mary's River watershed boundary. So that's where all the drainage occurs. And, and we did kind of focus on freshwater initially with this site because it really fills a gap in, in protection where I mentioned before, there's protected areas along um, this West Branch here, but they're really kind of fragmented and salmon use the whole watershed. So we wanted to take the approach of using a study area boundary that, that it, it makes sense ecologically, it's all connected. So we kind of are taking this um, big, broad approach right now. But just to say that this area is um, in quite a rural area of Nova Scotia, for those of you that might not know it, um, there's a population of less than 3,000 people in the area, and there's no major industrial developments in here. Um, the nearest um, First Nation communities are located um, just outside of the watershed, not too far. And likely there's lots of um, Mi'kmaq use in the area. So that's something we're, we're really looking forward to learning more about as we explore the case study. And we are looking at the estuary. Um, and right now we don't have a very well-defined marine boundary. Um, I think like this is the estuary here. If you guys can see my pointer, I'm assuming. <laughs> 
but it's kind of, it's quite narrow. Um, we could, you know, capture some of the adjacent um, inlets, but we'll, we'll determine that. We have really not looked at the data here and it's actually quite data poor. Um, we're hoping to get some more information on the estuary starting this summer and um, better understand it um, so, sooner rather than later. But it's really important to the conservation of, of, of salmon to protect that estuary. And um, it's also, I should have had the map up that shows the nearby Eastern Shore Islands area of interest, but it's located just to the west of the St. Mary's River. And um, there's an important connectivity story there where salmon do use this coastal area of the Eastern Shore Islands. It's a conservation objective to protect salmon and not protecting one of the key watersheds for it, the St. Mary's River, would um, not allow for that area of interest to meet its conservation objective. So um, I should have had that polygon here, but it, it is right around here and it's quite a large area. And there's like a connectivity story that's pretty clear there. So as I mentioned, this is a key area for Atlantic salmon. It's it's the, They've declined by quite a lot. Um, actually don't have the figure right here, but I believe it's 80% it's or more for the Southern upland population. This is a priority river for conservation for Atlantic salmon. It's one of two index rivers and the population while it's declined has remained relatively stable. And there's some anecdotal evidence that, that salmon are starting to come back and return in greater numbers than they were in recent years. So we're, we're hoping that's really the case. And, um, it, but this is a really great chance for, for salmon in this particular watershed and, and keeping it looking like this, like this, is a quite a pristine area, which is another great, um, which is quite unique to, to see this kind of nice um, riparian zone still intact. There's other species of importance in the area. We can't directly protect non-fish species under the Fisheries Act, but wood turtle use the riparian zones and the aquatic habitat and could be protected incidentally through this um, type, of, type of regulation. Brook floater is a species of special concern it's threatened in under provincial legislation, and this is core habitat and one of the areas that has the highest densities. Uh, well, the St. Mary's River is the area of the highest density of this species in the province. And it's also the most important area for wood turtle in the province as well. And there's been a ton of restoration work. There's been millions of dollars spent on restoring some of these areas. It's, it's relatively pristine, but there's been some logging activity that have over widened the streams. So there's been quite a bit of work to narrow the streams and make um, reestablish salmon pools so that they can um, rest in those cold water areas that they need and lots of community activity um, to do that to the St. Mary's River Association. And then there's a lot of other species that cross into green environments and adrivist species like eel and gaspero, important bait, uh, bait for lobster. And so there's more than just, you know, from a fish perspective, more than just salmon, there's quite a few other species in the area. And I'm just naming a couple here and focusing kind of on the marine species. Um, but just to say also that this area is very well known as a recreational fishing area in the province. People have come from far and wide to fish these ri this river, especially in the past when salmon was, was prevalent. Um, it was really well known as a salmon fishing spot and still is is an area that people are hoping the salmon will return to numbers great enough that it can one day be fished again. But in the meantime, everyone uh, that uses the area is fishing for other species like brook trout. And so some of the activities in the area, there's a historic Sherbrooke village. The whale sanctuary is proposed just outside of the estuary. So in wine, I think it's wine Harbor. Um, so that's just adjacent to it. Um, Forestry has been a big impactful industry in the past, and currently there is also a lot of forestry. Despite what you saw in that picture, there's there's some areas that have been um, cut quite a bit. This is not a picture from St. Mary's River, it's from elsewhere, but just to kind of note that, that forestry is a key industry in the area. There's an aquaculture proposal for shellfish in the estuary, and there's a small craft harbor in the estuary at Sonora. And one of the biggest potential threats to the area is mining. So there was a proposal for a mine called the Cochrane Hill Gold Mine that was going through the impact assessment process, the federal impact assessment process. 
but it was it did not meet the timeline. So it's been removed from that process and hasn't been proposed um, through any provincial process, but that could happen. And there's a number of different exploration licenses in the area. So there is the potential for um, mines to be proposed in this area, but there are currently no operating mines in the area. There's only um, really Tukoy mine, which is, is west of the area, but there's lots of proposed, there's lots of exploration licenses. Um, so we, we don't know a lot about the Mi'kmaq importance of the area. This information, it comes from a report that's, um, it's outdated and it's about 2005 and it wasn't done for the St. Mary's River. So it's kind of um, like we don't, we, we couldn't learn a lot more and that's something we're really, really looking forward to. But we know that this area has been used for, for time and memorial for inland travel and sustenance. Um, that Atlantic salmon and American eel are found in the area, and that it's at that point in time, uh, the, the the records that were um, from the 1700s that were identified in this study noted that this was one of the most significant historical Mi'kmaq communities in Anaganish and Guysboro counties at that time, and there are burial grounds in Sherbrooke and Glenelg Glen Glenelg Lake. So we are working with Mi'kmaq organizations to understand um, the importance and, and uh, cultural importance and activities in the area and hoping to learn more as we, as we talk more about this. And we did bring some of our um, Indigenous Habitat Participation Program recipients, uh, partners to the field to St. Mary's River in November and, and had a tour of the area that was done by the St. Mary's River Association Atlantic Salmon Federation and the Nova Scotia Salmon Association. So we kind of went to some of the really key areas for salmon, some of the key ecological areas and some of the nice Nova Scotia Nature Trust lands where there's a nice riparian zone to, to see that and saw some of the restoration that's been done and some of the restoration areas, some of the areas that are in need of restoration. So that was a really great visit and I'll, I'll talk more about sort of what's next um, in some of the next slides, but Another thing, just I'm not going to go through all the. This is a lot, but in our in our draft framework um, that's online, we do have some prioritization considerations or sort of ways to check does this site make a good potential candidate. There's a number of different um, considerations here, and they're not like weighted one over another. Um, they they could be if if there's something that's deemed to be of more importance. Um, Particularly, you know, if if this this is a priority area for conservation for Indigenous people, so that's something that you know maybe it's it's at the top um, could be a, become a higher priority. And one thing we we know about Nabusaganuk is that it meets most of these criteria. Um, we don't know really. We have to do a bit of a deep dive. Does does it contain limiting habitats? Um, because there's some areas that like this is the one and only area where the species spawns, for example, like that's a limiting habitat, but I don't know if we have a good answer to that, but all the other um, considerations we do know it checks those um, it meets those considerations, but we don't know is it a priority area of, of conservation for Indigenous people so that's a bit of a question mark and we're hoping to to hear more about that as we as we talk about this. And in terms of, you know, what could an ESA mean? What does it look like to get better illustrate this concept? Um, we need to explore these things. So if we were to designate an ESA, we need to identify conservation priorities to set. The, so what are we trying to protect? And then we make conservation and protection objectives based on, on what we're trying to protect. <clears throat> and then we have to identify boundaries. So we've, we're starting with a big study area, but eventually, that could change, you know, it could just have like the riparian zones are part of that. How big is the estuary? Do we go to adjacent estuaries? What does that look like? And that comes through um, engagement and consultation. We need to do a risk assessment to determine how we regulate activities. We need to collect Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge. And this actually comes like well before all of this, like that should be, we should be doing that as soon as possible. Um, and we need to basically provide um, an asset like a ecological, socioeconomic, and cultural overviews and assessments. And all of that sort of informs how the regulations will look. And this is every bullet here is a lot of work. 
Um, and we're really, you know, just kind of exploring some of these ideas as concepts, like starting with the watershed, it's, it's more of a study area. Um, and also like thinking about, well, how could this work in regulation? So in order to think about that, we have to sort of identify example conservation objectives, but so I'll show you some examples and some of the things we're exploring to better understand how an ESA could, could actually work. So I just I'm using this to sort of illustrate that, you know, we're we're kind of I've been talking a lot about fresh water, but salmon use estuaries. They spend important times of their life in estuaries as adults that are getting ready to migrate into their spawning grounds, but also as as um, they're smoltifying, they're changing their physiology to get ready as young salmon to enter the marine environment. And that's a critical life stage. So it's really important in that time. Um, which is only usually a few weeks long, sometimes longer, but that's a really vulnerable life stage. So it's important to um, protect this estuary, not just for salmon, but um, this is an important connectivity story. So we definitely need to, to look at the estuary and um, identify what we're trying to protect. So the idea that we have right now is, and this can apply in any large ESA is, um, looking at a watershed, it's a big area. So at that scale, thinking about fewer restrictions and regulations that would be focused more on bigger impacts. So not like what private landowners are doing, not at all, but more so on maybe what's happening on crown land, um, particularly in the riparian zone, and maybe on more pollution level, um, like big industry types of uh, restrictions or regulations. And then within that watershed, we could have zones that have a higher, that are higher, um, have higher sensitivity or ecological importance, where we might have more restrictions. And that's kind of what you see in MPAs. You often see zones that are more um, restrictive. There's more prohibitions. Um, so what this could mean, and I guess this isn't just for St. Mary's River for Nabusaganuk, it's for, for any any ESA, but in this case where it's a bigger uh, bigger area we're talking about, we think that most current uses would continue um, where there is no large industry and that industrial activities would need to meet a higher standard to be authorized by DFO. Riparian zone buffers could occur. Um, that riparian zone could be 30 meters or it could be more in, in a more sensitive zone. So we don't have a set um, you know, buffer that that will come with discussions and, and thinking about risk. Um, and then kind of focusing, you know, the regulation of riparian zones on the crown land. And so with private private landowners, there are bylaws that apply that and that's fine. And we would could focus on stewardship, but maybe in more sensitive areas, we we look at uh, at options um, for riparian zone management. Um, so some activities might be prohibited and it depends on, you know, what are we trying to protect? Can it be mitigated or avoided? If it can't, then it should be prohibited. Some of the freshwater things that could be prohibited or regulated include water course realignments, infilling, water extraction, water course crossings, shoreline hardening. Um, in the estuary, there's different types of activities. So dredging is something that could be occurring or may occur in the future aquaculture, marine plant harvesting, infilling, and shoreline hardening are just a few examples. For most ESAs, a restoration plan is required. Um, in the marine realm, I'm not sure it's as much required as it is in freshwater, but it could be. So we would need to assess that and then develop a plan and implement it. So we basically use this all depends on your conservation objectives. What are you trying to protect? And then that helps determine is the activity prohibited or is it prescribed? So using an example, this is kind of an, an easier than a species example, like a, a fish species example is focusing on, um, on eelgrass. So I'll walk through that in a bit more detail, but when it comes to like, what are we trying to protect in the estuary? These are just ideas. Like there's, there's a lot of things and this would come in a collaborative sense, um, but just to, to think about what are some of the species that use the estuary that might be important regionally. Um, American eel is important important um, to Mi'kmaq groups. Lumpfish is threatened by, uh, assessed as threatened under Kosuik. Cod is important, uh, lobster, 
And then there's all these other habitat types that could be protected with um, with the ESA in, in the area and in any estuary really, but I'll focus kind of more on eelgrass because we know it's present in the area and it's a really important habitat type that provides habitat for many fish species and is a carbon sink. So these are just some examples that would help determine the regulations and I'll describe that. And I'm not gonna go through all of these specifics here, but ideally you do have some sort of specific objectives or thresholds to try to meet. Um, but at a high level, we would likely for eelgrass want to ensure no loss. Um, so in, outside of an ESA, you can destroy eelgrass provided you offset for it. So you create habitat elsewhere and it's at a high ratio about three to one. Um, so you have to protect like three square meters for every one or sorry, create three square meters for every one lost. But in an ESA, that is just not allowed. So we can't destroy eelgrass. Um, we have to make sure that anywhere where eelgrass isn't, but it could establish, is also protected. So we don't want to lose areas that would be suitable for future eelgrass establishment. Making sure the quality of eelgrass and the supporting environment is maintained. And maintaining the coastal processes and features that allow for it to grow. Also restoring any lost eelgrass patches. So these are examples of what conservation and protection objectives could look like. And these can actually be written in the regulations for ESAs, which is another key difference with MPAs and ESAs is that we, we, have, we put these in the regulations themselves, the conservation objectives. So what this means for what activities could be, for example, prohibited, infilling, dredging, um, shoreline hardening are examples that you know, by hardening a shoreline, you could be impacting that um, the eelgrass bed itself. Um, even like vegetation removal next to an eelgrass bed could also could also be prohibited because if you're causing sedimentation, you could smother the eelgrass bed. So that's not an example in writing here, but another one. Um, and then other things like that might not be prohibited, but have a more stringent requirement. So maybe that small craft harbor has routine dredging and that it's far away from the eelgrass. So it can continue, but we put um, we put uh, bounds around it. So we would say you can't dredge within this distance of the eelgrass bed. So making sure there's lots of room that eelgrass wouldn't be affected. And then generally using heavy equipment and water, maybe wharf development, like building a wharf would be allowed, but you have to use piles and, and meet the standards that are best for um, minimizing impacts. Maybe aquaculture would have certain um, requirements around it. And then uh, things like aquatic invasive species and boating activities and fishing, while they might not be in the regulations themselves, they could be addressed in a management plan and using other existing re regulations in tandem to address those issues. <clears throat> So what we've been hearing, and we've been talking a lot about this case study and um, in, in anticipation for an upcoming workshop, but we've heard that um, we need to consult on, on this as a case study. Um, it's not a candidate like an area of interest um, for a marine protected area. It's just an exploratory case study, but we do think it's a good potential ESA candidate. So we're seeing if, you know, through this engagement, we can make it a candidate and launch that formal regulatory process. Um, so we haven't launched that formal regulatory process. We're still exploring, but um, consultation has been initiated and uh, starting in February and is ongoing. We heard that partners want a holistic approach. So we're continuing to explore the links with this and other projects like the Whale Sanctuary. We're learning from other initiatives and or we're starting to, we need to keep learning from these other initiatives like existing marine protected areas in the region um, and what we can learn from the, that process. Also, we really want to learn more about the Blues Cap Wilderness Area, which is, has been a positive move towards co-governance in Nova Scotia. So we're really interested in digging into that. Um, we know in, our Indigenous partners want to discuss what ESA governance and two-eyed seeing could look like. So we really want to do that. And, and we're, we've been collaboratively planning for a workshop we've, in April. So we've had a few planning meetings that have involved the, the folks that will be at the workshop to talk about what do you think the agenda should look like and kind of refining it through these meetings, where should it be, um, logistics, but largely like what, 
how should we do this and what should the agenda look like? So we've been working really collaboratively to develop um, that workshop and it really will set the stage for moving forward with our Mi'kmaq partners and others. So it will help us vision what do we want? What's your vision for the area? What do you want to protect? And what are the threats? And then getting some feedback, hopefully, on, on engagement processes going forward. How do folks want to be involved in the process moving forward? So that's those are the kinds of things we're hoping to get from the workshop. Um, we're really, really excited about it. And it's been great to work together to develop an agenda for that. And then we continue to collect information and knowledge to just better understand the area everything from ecology to the human uses of the area. And there's going to be hopefully some summer field work on the eelgrass beds because we know there's eelgrass there, but we don't know much about it. So we're hoping, um, and I noticed one of our, our um, partners on the line, CPAWS, is hoping to do some work in the estuary to further our understanding of what lives there and you know what is the eelgrass like. And we're hoping to do that within DFO science as well to map it out, hopefully. Um, and also my colleague, Ben Collison is working to um, assess fish passage throughout the watershed, looking at the culverts and determining are they passable. And there has been some work done on that by the Nova Scotia Salmon Association. We're continuing to engage with the province on this. And the Atlantic Salmon Federation has a case study that they're developing specifically for the site to make recommendations on, on this going forward. So um, I, I, this is a kind of a big picture, very high level, um, you know, where this could go in Nova Scotia. So we're, we're finished engaging on the framework and it's expected to be published in April. We are developing this case study as a potential ESA candidate and we're going to continue to do that. And potentially it could become a candidate as early as this year, maybe next year. And that would launch a regulatory process, which means uh, developing the regulations and then establishing it and management. This is a long process. I'll describe it in a further slide. But in the meantime, um, we could explore other potential candidates. We have looked at a, a case study for the Stubiak, um, looking specifically at the striped bass spawning area. It's not complete. It's, it's a more complicated story for a number of reasons, but um, it's been interesting to think about that but we would be happy to look at nominations for strong potential candidates and, and how we could move those forward as well. Um, so on the draft framework, I'll just, this is really quick. Um, see, I'm kind of talking too much <laughs> as usual. Um, but so the draft framework, just to tell you about what it is, it really provides some high level guidance on how ESAs would be identified, established and managed. Um, it's very general because of the differences across Canada. So it, when you see it, it won't have a lot of detail, but that's because the detail does matter from region to region. So that can be worked out on a regional basis. It does describe what ESAs are in their role. It includes a number of guiding principles and definition for our definitions for our ecological criteria. It um, describes each phase. So identifying sites could be done by DFO, could be done as nominations to DFO, which we'd provide guidance on. In the meantime, you can use the framework and look at those prioritization criteria. It could be done in a collaborative, at collaborative tables as well. Um, and then it also describes the regulatory process, which mirrors the MPA regulatory process. It provides a broad management plan um, contents, what a management plan would include and notes the potential for co-management. It notes that all phases will involve engagement and or consultation with indigenous peoples, provinces and territories and stakeholders. And that that's very important for the success of an ESA. And that engagement with indigenous peoples will start early. And in some cases like the Nabusaganook, we have started at this case study level to try to bring that two I'd seen approach in now. Um, but generally, this is something that would be continuous throughout the implementation process and follow the principles of UNDRIP. So this is just like a high level sort of schematic to show that identification, as I mentioned, um, could be done by DFO, by nominations or collaboratively, and that throughout, um, throughout this identification process, collaboration will occur. And this is really an information gathering stage to identify potential candidates that have a good chance of success as established ESAs. 
So this process, you know, could take one to two years if you're walking through a particular case study before it's identified and announced as a candidate. And then developing a regulation can take quite a long time, anywhere from two to six years. So this would be con consultation and targeted engagement um, in the form of maybe advisory committees, nation to nation working groups, um, federal, indigenous, provincial, territorial working groups, so tri trilateral groups. Um, so there's a number of ways this could go. And then, um, then once an ESA regulation is developed, it's, uh, it's established in regulation and designated. And then there's ongoing management. So management planning really happens at this early stage to help determine if it's a feasible candidate and determine how partners would want to be involved in management in things like scientific monitoring, um, also, like maybe hopefully we can co-write a management plan and, and develop that together, um, identify what the partnerships arrangements are and, and what kind of collaborative management would take place. And this is I'm not going to go through this because I want to leave time for questions, but it's just like a more detailed um, overview of what each phase of ESA implementation involves. That is my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Amy. Very much appreciated. What we're going to do now is move to the chat box um, to see if anybody has any questions for Amy. And then uh, we'll, um, I can see a couple questions and then we'll also have the opportunity if anybody wants to raise their hand, somebody can keep an eye on that as well. Um, Karen, I think you have two questions. So go ahead and take the mic and you can ask Amy your questions. Hi there. Am I unmuted? And we are. We can hear you. Okay, thanks. Hard to know at home sometimes. Uh, well, thank you for this presentation. It's really interesting. Uh, I'm really excited about this as someone who loves the St. Mary's River and got to know it from a land conservation perspective. It's really interesting how this could be very complementary to the extensive work that's been done there already. Uh, I have two questions related to potential ways in which ESAs could be regulated. Uh, by the federal government, and it has to do with the recent threat of the Cochrane Hill gold mine right beside uh, the St. Mary's River. So I work with the Ecology Action Center, and many groups spoke up against that particular mine because of the threats to the conservation values in the river. Um, so one thing I've seen with the, with the federal government and mines that are um, evaluated and regulated by the federal government is that the effluent, the release from the mines, has to meet a uh, set of criteria called the MDMERs, the Metal and Diamond Mining Effluent Regulations. And so at the time, that was the level that if the mine went ahead, the effluent would have to meet. And those levels for like pH and different chemicals in the water are not based on science actually, and they're not based on the needs of some of the things in the river, like salmon and trout, for example. So with the establishment of an ESA at the St. Mary's or anywhere else, could the federal government go above and beyond its usual regulations for things in the water, like the MDMERs? Would it create a new sort of situation where the, fed the federal government would require something of industry that they don't normally require? Thank you so much for this question, Karen. It's very well thought out, and I really love this question. We are exploring that right now um, with ECCC. And the whole fact of the matter is that if your conservation objectives are to, uh, let's say, maintain or improve um, the water quality, how can you have effluent in, in there? How can you? Like, how can you let the MDMER apply? The thresholds are worse than the CCME. They're, they're not good enough for salmon. So I, I don't think that effluent could be authorized to occur at those levels, if that effluent could meet those baseline conditions, perhaps it could be allowed. So we are exploring that in terms of like the Fisheries Act does have, um, it does delegate responsibility, as I'm sure you know, to Environment and Climate Change Canada for the deposit of deleterious substances. And for everyone's awareness, it is illegal to deposit deleterious substances, but if you have a mine and you fall into these regulations, it's not illegal. So ECCC does regulate that. So we are working closely with them because they regulate that part of the act, we regulate this part of the act. And how does that work together? <laughs> Excuse me. So 
we're trying to work through how this could work. But in, in my opinion, if the conservation objectives are to meet the current water quality guidelines, there is no way that you could have effluent at that, at those thresholds that would be allowed. So we're, we're working out the details of that, but it just seems a little meaningless to allow that kind of thing to occur in an ESA. Okay, well, that is encouraging that you're seeing that sort of collision of potential objectives by different aspects of the government. The other regulatory question, regulations are my jam. So that's what I'm asking about. Uh, another regulatory collide is that in Nova Scotia, water withdrawal, including for industrial use like mines and other things, is regulated by the province. And they have a sort of black box formula that you can't find out about, about how much water is withdrawn from a water body or a watershed. So my understanding is the federal government doesn't currently have jurisdiction there. Could, through an ESA, the federal government have jurisdiction over something they, or input at least, over something that they haven't had before, such as water withdrawal? Yes. So if it does impact the conservation objectives, then yes. And that's one of the things we've been saying is that the the stand like there's certain things that don't get put forward to DFO um, mm -hmm. because they don't meet certain thresholds. Water withdrawals is one of them. So unless you're withdrawing massive amounts of water, it might, I don't know exactly off the top of my head what that threshold is in which it does come to us, but it's a, it's a high quantity of withdrawal. So in an ESA, there could be a much lower requirement in which it does come to us. So if it depends on the conservation objectives and and what those we can set those thresholds in the regulation and potentially make those things come to us. We have to have that discussion with the province and and in this case study, like we can explore that and and what is too much for the watershed. And we do have some guidance on that, some um, peer review guidance on on how much. So we can look to that to determine, you know, how would this be regulated? How much would be allowed? And does it apply to certain areas or does it apply to the whole watershed and how does that work? So it's not so cut and dry, black and white that that this will just be status quo. It could very well come to us at, for a review to, to make an authorization. Hmm, okay, interesting. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks, Amy. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to let me know in the chat box, or if you have the ability to raise your hand, go ahead and raise your hand, uh, and then we'll um, have Amy address those. Uh, we will be moving to a uh, uh, Indigenous or Mi'kmaq specific section at seven o'clock, um, but we have a few minutes more uh, to cover off any questions, so just let us know. All right, and I don't see any hands coming up at this point. I know that's always tricky. Uh, everybody's trying to find buttons and everything, but uh, Beck, what I'll do then is turn it over to you for a moment. And uh, I think we'll just close out this part of the session and we'll probably move into the the uh, other space right after that. So over to you, Beck. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you so much, Amy, for the wonderful presentation. And it was so nice to hear such a well thought out question as well. Um, just a, a couple of things to transition us into the Indigenous only portion of our presentation and Q&A tonight. Um, before everybody starts to close off and we transition to the Indigenous only portion, we do have a door prize winner. So um, I apologize if I don't pronounce this correctly, but uh, congratulations to Jamana Khan. I do have an email for you, so I'm going to reach out and we'll get everything squared away for you to receive your door prize. We always try to su support a Mi'kmaq artisan uh, with the door prizes. So I'm excited to see what you get and I'll reach out. Congratulations. Uh, for everyone else, if there are still no more questions, we'll ask that we take the next few minutes to sort of filter out if you don't identify as Indigenous, and that way we can really work hard to have a meaningful con conversation uh, in the next 30 minutes with our speaker, Amy, and uh, your team from KMKNO, UINR, CMM, uh, Ocean Earth, and your facilitator will stay on as well for that portion. So thank you so much, everyone. I think that was all that I needed to say to everyone. Heidi. 
Um, I suppose I can remind everyone of our last webinar coming up a week today. Heidi was waiting for me to say it. I can see it on your face. Um, so a week today, we've got our last speaker this fiscal coming to join us. It's going to be March 28th in the same time slot, 6 until 7.30 p.m. Uh, this presentation is titled Community-Led Management Planning, the Rising Tide that Guides Our Collective Ancestral Canoes into the Future. And it's going to be co-presented, which are always some of the best presentations, by Akolu Lindsay, a West Maui community member, and Heather Barna, a collaborative conservation planner. So that'll be our last one next week, 6 till 7.30. And we hope to see you guys there. Uh, stay tuned on the same channels that you saw this poster. We'll be advertising that one as well. And thanks so much, Amy. Just hang tight with us, and then we'll get back to a conversation. Um. Thank you for tonight, uh, everybody that joined in into our uh, webinar series. Um, I was everything that that we always take part in. It's very insightful and informative. Um, unfortunately, I know you know the trouble that our rivers are in and our, our waters around any river, and I guess uh, the atmosphere and. Um, around any region, uh, whether it's around uh, the ground or forestry or rivers, uh, they all come to one place. You know, at the end of the day, you know what they say, everything goes downhill. Uh, but in any case, uh, it ends up in certain areas, whether it's good or bad. Uh, most of the days that we, you know, we live in today, uh, it's mostly has been bad. Uh, we're trying to alleviate all these problems that we, we do face today. But um, unfortunately, uh, species and environments still get into trouble. And we're, we're basically at a recovery stage of trying to fix issues that we didn't think we were going to have to fix uh, 20 years ago. But we are at that area where uh, we finally realize that we've done a little bit too much um, to rivers, to lakes, to oceans. Um, Biggest example would be uh, the codfish. I have water on both sides of my house and uh, I used to catch codfish by the dozens without even trying. Salmon within our rivers around Escazonia and around the rivers in Cape Breton, you know, we're very plentiful. Um, we don't harvest uh, salmon uh, in our rivers today because even the kids, uh, they all realize, you know, the, the species that are in trouble need our help and when it comes to the Mi'kmaq as I said uh, I'm very proud to say that I've seen actually youth that I grew up in the rivers around uh, Unamagi that I fished um, you know I've seen troubles um, and they've seen troubles and we it's we've we've heard a lot of stuff from our ancestors our great great grandparents or um and grandparents and parents. Um, my, the craziest thing about all of this stuff is uh, my great, great grandfather was uh, John Denny and John Denny Jr., uh, which was, would have been the, the grand chief uh, and the lineage of grand chief is within my blood and the history and everything that we've always spoken about and where I am today. Um, uh, my parents, uh, my father, grandfather, uh, you know, my grand, great grandfather, and my grandfather were military people. My father was chief, a council member for many years, but he was a chief for 25 years. So he still he instilled a lot of good stuff within my my blood, my my mind, my heart. So I'm lucky in that sense. Um, but everything that we do today seems to be uh, coming back to us, uh, that notion of two wide seeing. Um, we've had our own way of looking and observing, and that's our eyes. Uh, Western knowledge came in with their science, and uh, we've always had our own science. Uh, the only knowledge that, the, the only difference between our systems and the Western systems, uh, they came up with numbers and figures. We've always known that there's two salmon in the river, there's two salmon in a river, that doesn't change. But the Western science comes in with numbers and estimates and uh, square footage and square yardage of rivers in whatever species that we're in or lakes, uh, it doesn't really matter, but it all comes back down to the, 
to the same point where things aren't right. Uh, species are dying, species are missing, or they're, they're actually falling out of uh, life. Its life cycle is about to end. Uh, we have to start doing stuff and we are at, at a stage where we have to do stuff. And um, you know, fortunately our, our treaty rights and what's guaranteed under the constitution of Canada is uh, they're entrenched so nobody can actually touch them. So this gives us the right to actually intervene when governments can't um, do their job right. Uh, we can hold people or government or agencies to account today because of our treaty rights, which is something special in my opinion. Um, I always said uh, it's too bad that you know, the Mi'kmaq have to be relied upon or First Nations of this country uh, even with governments and agencies that's, that have always been against us, uh, they seem to come around at the end to, to ask us to help within um, problematic or pr troubled areas, uh, whether it's waters or air or, you know, lands, wherever, or forests. But, you know, it, it just comes back to us as a natural healing process where uh, our creator has given us something that we need to take more care of. Um, you know, our populations are, aren't that big and the history of our people and what we do and where we live is knowledge that has been passed down for uh, thousands of years. So we, are, we know exactly where we're at, what stage, but you know, with the conditions that we've been placed uh, over the last many hundreds of years, uh, we weren't, we were made to be not as important uh, as everybody else uh, within North America. Uh, the colonial governments actually made that happen and you know, this, to show us that we weren't equal or whatever less than equal. But at the end of the day, this past uh, many years, you know, people have gr grown to know that we are actually not equal or uh, a little bit more than equal uh, to our counterparts because we have rights and we have uh, things that uh, we have court rulings and treaties that we that are bound that you know bound governments uh, into following and doing stuff in you know I guess uh, coexistent with our people and our ways of life. At the end of the day, um, somebody has to be held accountable. Uh, for the actions of uh, this country, the people that, you know, industry uh, that really don't care about the environment or environments, uh, global warming and gases, greenhouse gases and so forth. Uh, we know what's going on. Uh, we've seen the changes around uh, Mi'kma'ki that we've, we've witnessed, uh, the coming and going of species and near extent and near extent I guess, uh, uh, animals and uh, bugs. And the smallest thing uh, that we don't see anymore around here are bats. You know, I always say uh, in everything that I take part in, uh, life is like a spider web, uh, whether it's in the river, or whether it's in the ocean or on land. Uh, you pull a portion of that spider web and you break certain strengths uh, within that web, then other parts start, you know, deteriorating and they fall apart. Um, if we don't remain unified and the environment doesn't stay where it's supposed to stay, um, we're just going to create more problems and um, more species and lands. And I mean, everything is very dependent on everything. Like I said, that's why I describe it as a spider web. You, you, you push one end of it, the whole web moves. So you have to be very careful of what we do today. Um, if not, then we just continue that, I guess, a drastic s slope on our way down to uh, extinction. <laughs> Look at the world where it's at today, the wars and uh, oil and the greater, the best thing I've ever seen over the last, 
I, I can't really say it's a good thing that came from this current war of Ukraine. Um, it pushed people back to our natural resources. Now we're heavily invested in taking energy from the sun and uh, not really using more carbon fuels or oils or anything that, you know, gases that might hurt our environment even more. We're going back to something that our creator gave us, natural energy that we've always uh, had for uh, as long as we've been created. Everything revolves around the sun and uh, it, it's free. And that's a great thing. But we, we're going down that road of technologies where we're utilizing this. Um, and that's a great thing to see because the environment uh, is something that we need to preserve. And when we're digging holes in the ground and taking coal and stuff, uh, in our fresh waters. I mean, we just start down that uh, narrow slope or uh, rabbit hole where we, we won't be able to get out of it uh, sometime, but we're actually doing something good now. We're, we're, we are relying on one another and all First Nations peoples around this country um, and especially in Mi'kma'ki uh, where we have to do our own work here in uh, Nova Scotia. But we're a very close knit society or community around the whole of Mi'kmaq, which includes Newfoundland, um, Eastern Maine, Quebec, uh, all these areas that are bound in Atlantic Canada. So uh, thank you all for tonight. Um, it was great. I appreciate everything that I've had that that I've heard. Um, I just want to say well, audio. And uh, tonight, when I do my closing prayer, I just want to thank our creator that, you know, he, he gave us this, this night uh, has always been given. A, you know, I always say that the creator puts people together. There's a reason why people meet. Uh, it's, it is destiny. But as uh, our elders around our neighborhood, uh, in my neighborhood in Escazoni here, uh, I lost a son. Um, he was just 14. Uh, we're doing fine today. Uh, we still suffer uh, the, odd, uh, the odd days and it just comes in hard on us. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the old saying of our elders is that there's nothing we can do about it because uh, before we actually came to this world, uh, we entered, uh, we actually agreed to uh, all the suffering uh, that we take and uh, get from this world. And, you know, we wouldn't be here without us actually agreeing to this. Um, they say, which means, uh, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about what has taken place uh, because it's already been written before we actually came here. And we already agreed to the suffering and the pain that we all go through. So in, 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 in a sense, uh, this is how this world um, is coming to, or there's a, a heavy interference uh, that's kind of bad that we, we're trying to overcome. And because I certainly know for a fact I wouldn't agree to the, you know, deteriorate to what's been given to us uh, by our creator. You just don't go out and destroy stuff. Um, so, which is why we're all here tonight. Um, we're a, a community that's, that really believes that we can make a difference and we do make a difference because a lot of eyes are opening up tonight and every time that we get together, uh, we discuss all of these problematic areas that we, we try to resolve and fix. Uh, but, you know, it's something better than not fixing. And you know, as we move forward um, as nations, of people, um, I believe that we all can get together and work together. Two eyed seeing and uh, Western science and other types of uh, information that we gather, uh, whether it's from the elders uh, over many years, um, we we have to do it uh, in order to to fix the environment and fix this world that, that we live around. In any case, uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm going to thank our creator for putting us together again uh, for tonight and all the discussions that we've had 
and ask him again to strengthen our bonds and our ways of seeing things uh, so that we all may see from the same eye, actually. Um, what do we want to call it, two-eyed seeing or whatever else that we want to discuss with it. But I think is uh, the most important part of everything that we do tonight and, and every day is uh, we work together. Uh, we won't, we don't fight. Um, we try to resolve issues that, you know, we know that are problematic within this world of ours. But in order to fix the bigger world, we have to fix uh, our own backyards. And I think we're heading down that road. And it's very, uh, it's nice to see. Thank you. Um, so I will, I will go ahead and make my and uh, say the closing prayer. Kizuk, Olda Asidam, Nandil Mawagi Eglau, Kisku Gala Willag. Olda Asidari in the Muyagala, Tlusuan, days ago. Olda Asidari in the Muyag, Squidno, Yisku Ga Maulu Gudiagig. Well, in Chida, in the Muin, Tlusuan, Kamala Munka, Watakadal, Anunjuk. Il Gizidun. The doughty, in Gizin, Gedidun da hoi nudani dan dluen, haka scudeman, ula willag, Uldas ignemun lina, plus one, the baskamal, Dana abonumadul de desnin, washkuda al nagwigal, Mudladigoan, Nina Moinamuak, it plus one, ma chidan will dam ya, mani gizidia de mugoi, a gnu de massi mesu gisco, gizigoji nanin. But Mr. Gisco, Bemgano de Massi, Remijuaji, near, Ignamu and Goat Lusua and Nana, the Hoela, Nagogel, Ignamu Yagla, Wellagel, Missis Kidu, Nemidu, a mammy go to Abartuk. Balo tear, Mr. Gisco, Mudamogaji do it, and Elgis Lassi, Coy, Gilbas Kajidun, Adelici, Delici again, well, well, Darcy, and there's a coy gizing in a winding of its hammo. How bassy people are in Numa. Nancy could do you upset this come? The Zalu Legum said, I will aliak, clear down with Lam Sedasik, Dan de Lotti, Kadua, Edawaso Kig Mahnegamoka, which we done on Agus Edit took. I will need, I will bant the village, Kamalamona, when you are a school out on that. Will ask his donors it Hamola, about Lido, Dan Dinginimu Yakup, Dan del Tegum Sikoi. Will Alin is come? Och Chidem said one, at Thank you.